to first thank Actual Justice Warrior and Prax Ben for promoting my channel. I'm getting close to 700 subscribers and hopefully I would reach 1k by the end of next month. I also want to announce that on February 24th to the 27th, I will be attending CPAC 2022 in Orlando, Florida. So if you're one of those planning on going, you can expect to bump into me along with Ox Justice Warrior and Nuance Bro. As my subscribers may know, my last video was part one of my response to Second Thoughts video in which he argues that liberty and freedom are actually quote unquote left wing ideals. I initially was going to follow with part two, however, I wish to expand upon something that was brought up in part one, that being the relation between positive liberty and individual free will. So consider this as part 1.5 of my video response to Second Thoughts. If you haven't seen part 1 of my response yet, I recommend you watch it now before viewing this video as it will be continuing on points that I brought up in part 1. For those who did watch my second thought video, you will remember that I left off in the part in which Chapman aka second thought poorly defines positive liberty. In fact, he defines it as quote unquote the ability to act on one's free will. In my response, I brought up that positive liberty should be correctly described as the freedom to act in taking control of one's interests or in a way to discover one's fundamental purpose. In addition, I emphasize that acting upon self-interest aka positive liberty should not be confused with acting upon free will and in reality, positive liberty requires constraining free will. This is precisely what I will be discussing in this video on why and how positive liberty intrudes against free will. Of course, there are some individuals who would question my assertions, especially when certain sources like Wikipedia defines positive liberty as the capacity to act on one's free will. Though funny enough, in their definition, Wikipedia cites Isaiah Berlin's four essays on liberty, despite the term free will not once been used or implied by Berlin in his essay. Before I delve into why positive liberty violates individual free will, I must explain what I mean by free will as I'm pretty sure that there would be some determinists watching this video. In a metaphysical sense, free will is the power or capacity to choose among alternatives or to act in certain situations independently of natural, social, or divine restraints. Of course, there are philosophical debates on whether humans truly have free will or if individual choices or actions are predetermined, either by genetic design, guided by past events, or by values and perspectives ingrained by one's social circle. As a compatibilist, I do see some merit in the determinist perspective of human nature. In fact, there's a great documentary out there called Three Identical Strangers that explores the concepts of free will and determinism by documenting the lives of three identical twins that were deliberately split after birth and adopted by separate parents as part of a scientific nature versus nurture experiment meant to study the development impact of genetically identical siblings raised in different social economic circumstances. If you got the chance, I recommend you guys to check it out. Anyway, regardless if our choices or decisions are truly acted upon by libertarian free will or by determinism, that doesn't discredit the notion that the autonomy of the individual mind should be respected. Hence, there is a second meaning of free will. That being, regardless if your decisions were chosen by your independent will or guided by nature, you have the right to choose, to believe, to think, and to feel without the interference of others. Of course, your choices aren't free from consequences, especially when those choices aggress against other people's free will. However, that doesn't mean that, for instance, individuals or the state should force a skinhead to renounce his racism or white nationalist ideology, or to force homosexuals into partaking in conversion therapy, or even push commies like Second Thought out of helicopters over their politics despite not having committed any acts of aggression towards anyone. We are in charge of our own mind, and when it comes to what makes me me and you you, should not be punished by the state. Now what does this have to do with positive liberty? On the surface, it appears to coincide with free will, as stated by Isaiah Berlin, the positive sense of the word liberty derives from the wish on the part of the individual to be his own master. I wish my life and decisions to depend on myself 
not on external forces or whatever kind. I wish to be the instrument of my own, not of other men's acts of will. I wish to be a subject, not an object, to be moved by reason, by conscious purpose, which are my own, not by cause which affects me, as it were, from outside. At first, positive liberty sounds a whole lot like free will. However, if you delve deep enough into the concept of positive liberty, one will realize that not only does it intrude on individual free will, but also it even goes as far to advocate for the hacking of the human mind for the common good. To recap, positive liberty is the absence of internal limits, which is the opposite of negative liberty, which is the freedom from external limits, i.e. the government. As previously mentioned in my second thought video, internal limits can refer to internal factors that hinder one's ability to act in one's self-interest. However, this isn't limited to just class, education, or ableism. Those who subscribe to positive liberty, which for the sake of this video will be referring to them as positive libertarians, have a pseudo-Freudian interpretation of free will. According to positive libertarians, the human conscious is divided into two selves. The higher self, which is the rational, reflecting self that is capable of moral action and of taking responsibility, and the lower self, which is the self of passion, unreflecting desires, and irrational impulses. Allegedly, the conflicting selves clash with each other when one is faced with choices. This was elaborated by Isaiah Berlin. Quote, one way of making this clear is in terms of the independent momentum, which the, initially perhaps quite harmless, metaphor of self-mastery acquired, I am my own master, I am a slave to no man, but may not be a slave to nature, or to my own unbridled passions? Are these not so many species of identical genus, slave, some political or legal, others moral or spiritual? Have not men have the experience of liberating themselves from spiritual slavery or slavery to nature? And do they not in the course of it become aware, on the one hand, of a self which dominates, and on the other, of something in them which is brought to heal? This dominant self is then variously identified with reason, with my higher nature, with the self which calculates and aims at what will satisfy in in the long run, with my real or ideal or autonomous self, or with myself at its best, which is then contrasted with my irrational impulses, uncontrolled desires, my lower nature, the pursuit of immediated pleasure, my empirical or heteronymous self swept by every gust of desires and passion, needing to be rigidly displaced if it is ever to rise to full height of its real nature. I should clarify that although I am citing Isaiah Berlin, his essay isn't actually meant to defend positive liberty. In fact, Berlin actually makes criticisms of positive liberty, which will eventually be addressed. Going back to the quote, to summarize Berlin, although an individual can be free from being a slave to the state or by a literal slave master, one wouldn't be completely free as they will still be a slave to themselves since a person's irrational impulses and desires can prevent them from acting upon his or her self-interest. Take this example. Imagine you are driving a car through town and you come to a fork in the road. There is no signs telling you where to go, nor are you guided by a GPS. So when you decide to turn left, it seems to make sense that you, the driver, is completely free. However, let's say that the reason you turn left and not right is that you are a crack addict and that you are heading to a trap house. Rather than driving, you feel like you're being driven as your urge to smoke crack leads you to uncontrollably to turn the wheel left. Moreover, you're perfectly aware that if you had turned right on the fork, it would have led you to a nearby rehab center that could have assisted you with your drug addiction. In this sense, positive libertarians would argue that you, the driver, aren't free at all because your impulses had hindered you from acting upon your self-interest of ending your cocaine addiction. This is why those advocating for positive liberty believe that individual free will must be oppressed to liberate the people from the shackles of one's id. This leads to what is referred to as the paradox of positive liberty. That being because your higher self is enslaved by your lower self, considering that there's some individuals who are more quote unquote rational than others, under the pretext of positive liberty, those who are rational inherently knows what is in their and others rational interests and should therefore force people less rational than themselves to do the rational thing because by forcing others to be rational, you are in fact liberating them from their lower self and allowing them to be fully free. 
In other words, or simply the paradox aspect of positive liberty, is that freedom in a positive sense requires being coerced or even aggressed upon by others that are deemed more rational than oneself. This is in fact one of Berlin's criticisms of positive liberty. Though I wish Berlin could have critiqued the pseudo-Freudian aspects of positive freedom as the perspective of a divided self is based upon Sigmund Freud's categorization of the human psyche. For those who are not familiar with psychology, the notion of a higher self and lower self seems to be based on the concept of the id and the superego, with the higher self being the superego, which operates as the moral conscious and the quote unquote lower self being the id or the conscious responsible for instincts and desires. Now the reason why I consider this pseudo Freudian is because one, they falsely claim that the superego or the higher self is the true self and two, they deliberately left out the third component of the human psyche, that being the ego, which is the actual true self that is responsible for dealing with reality and weighs the costs and benefits of inaction before deciding to act upon or abandon impulses. Taking ego into account, both the id and the superego are both essential parts of one's conscience. If we were to repress the id on the grounds of liberating the true self, we wouldn't in the process be freeing mankind but rather enslaving them to their superego. Of course, positive liberty is more than just stopping bad habits such as drug abuse. In fact, it is much broader than you might think when considering what exactly is self-interest. Most notably, the loony leftist interpretation of self-interest. Is it to act upon what you alone want? Or is it to act upon the rational interests of society? According to positive libertarians such as Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the individual is part of one large entity, that being society or the collective, and that true self-interest is to act towards the common good. To once again quote Isaiah Berlin, presently the two selves may be represented as divided by an even larger gap. The real self may be conceived as something wider than the individual as the term is normally understood as a social whole of which the individual is an element or aspect, a tribe, a race, a church, a state. This entity is then identified as being the true self which by imposing its collective or organic single will upon its recalcitrant members achieves its own and therefore their higher freedom. The pearls of using organic metaphors to justify the coercion of some men by others in order to raise them up to a higher level of freedom have been often been pointed out. But what gives such plausibility as to has to this kind of language is that we recognize that it is possible and at times justifiable to coerce men in the name of some goal, let's say justice or public health, which they would, if they were more enlightened, themselves pursue, but do not because they are blind or ignorant or corrupt. Isaiah Berlin, a Russian who escaped Bolshevik oppression, saw firsthand how communists distorted the noble concepts of freedom and self-mastery as a tactic in disguising their dictatorship and to justify their authoritarian policies. Redefining freedom to exclude individualism and free will is what enabled the likes of the Soviet Union to propagate that they, rather than the liberal democracies of the West, were the true champions of freedom while simultaneously imprisoning their own citizens into labor camps for acting upon their human rights. In addition, these totalitarian regimes seek to eradicate the parts of human instincts that defied the collectivist ideology of the state. In the case of the USSR, the Communist Party attempted to alter human values by forming what would be known as the Soviet New Man which was a socialist moral code meant to indoctrinate Soviet citizens to repress their greedy, self-centered impulses and transform the individual into a clockwork orange for communism. An individual that, in the standards of Marxist doctrine, would be hardworking, collectivistic, patriotic, and unfailingly loyal to the socialist state, which according to then-Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev, would lead to the annihilation of any traces of religion, corruption, and quote-unquote drunkenness. Under absolute positive liberty, there's no limits or hard lines that can't be crossed when freeing the individual in quotation marks. As stated by Berlin, quote, this renders it easy for me to convince of myself as coercing others for their own sake. In their, not my interest, I am then claiming that I know what they truly need better than they know it themselves. What at most this entails is that they would not resist me if they were rational and as wise as I and understood their interests as I do. Once I take this view, I am in the position to ignore the actual wishes of men or societies to bully, oppress, torture them in the name and on behalf of their real selves 
in the secure knowledge that whatever is the true goal of man. This has been repeatedly done by totalitarian states. From indoctrination, torture, to outright brainwashing. This may sound like something out of a Stanley Kubrick film. However, as documented by psychiatrist and writer Robert J. Lifton in his 1963 book, Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism, a story of brainwashing in China, communist regimes such as China under the reign of Chairman Mao Zedong utilized the same manipulative tactics commonly practiced by religious cults to brainwash subjects to adhere to socialist morals and Maoist thought. I pretty much elaborated on why positive liberty is an oxymoronic concept that serves as a pipeline for totalitarianism. It is not a surprise that someone like Second Thought would idolize such a concept because of his preference for authoritarian dictatorships. Anyway, please like and share this video, leave your thoughts in the comments below, and if you haven't so already, please subscribe to my channel. Oh, and remember that all commies are bad.